Hello and welcome to Starting Over with Shannon. This is a podcast about fresh starts, new chapters and embracing change and challenge to become a better version of ourselves and create a better world around us. I'm your host Shannon Jenkins and every week I'll be bringing you a different starting over story with tips on how to conquer life's difficulties to find greater joy, meaning and purpose. Hello, lovely listeners. Thank you for being here and thank you for choosing this episode today. So I am back in Switzerland after spending the last five days in the beautiful city, actually, of Strasbourg in France. And I was participating in a couple's retreat and I wanted to do a solo episode on this to share with you some of the lessons and stories and takeaways that I took from that time. So it was quite an impromptu experience on on our part, but it just so happened that it was actually David's parents who were were the retreat hosts and therapists. And this was their last ever retreat before retirement. So we thought, do you know what? We should totally go support them, stay open-minded, even though we don't really know what to expect. Well, it was more me who thought this at first because David had dismissed this Imago method that I'm going to talk about as a lot of parroting nonsense. So he had never done one before, wasn't particularly interested. But by the end of the retreat, we both genuinely saw the unexpected benefits and felt such a depth of connection that we didn't, yeah, really didn't expect. So we've committed to practicing this now together for the next three months. So we'll see how we get on. But yeah, couples therapy. I mean, who who typically goes to couples therapy? It's usually people who have relationship problems, right? You know, difficulty communicating, loss of connection, breach of trust, betrayal, tension. I think David and I were definitely the anomaly in the group in participate in the fact that we had only been married for one month. So I think it's true without the link of our in-laws, we wouldn't have seen any obvious reason to do this because it's true that most of the other 25 or so couples there were typically in that position of having been together for a long time and they were wanting to repair and reconnect or maybe for some even work out whether to stay together or not, which was also a very valid reason for attending. But you know what? I'm so glad we went. And I also realized like, wow, now is the time to start. Really, like don't don't wait until there are significant problems. Like start really learning and understanding from now why we give love and like to receive love in the way that we do. You know, ask questions like who do we fall in love with and why? And of course, linked to that is a need to understand more deeply the needs that we have or the needs that weren't met in our childhood in particular and really do a deeper investigation into our relational experience with our caregivers in childhood. Also, another key theme was like really learning how to communicate with each other more effectively, which turns out isn't as simple as I thought it was. I was there thinking, I'm I'm a great listener. Yeah, like I think this is one of my strengths. Turns out I um, have a little bit of work to do. (laughs) But yeah, the focus of this episode, obviously it has a lot of couple elements, but even if you are single right now, I do hope that this podcast prompts some reflection for how you've shown up in past relationships and what you'd possibly like to change, do differently next time, or even understand better about yourself. So before sharing some of the lessons, key takeaways with you, I want to tell you about this type of therapy. So Imago Relationship Therapy. This is what the workshop and the whole retreat, in fact, was based around. So Imago Relationship Therapy, it was created in 1980 by Dr. Harville Hendricks and Dr. Helen LaKelly Hunt. And it became increasingly popular after... Harville Hendricks, huge NYT bestseller, Getting the Love You Want, A Guide for Couples. It was released in 1988. It still sells super well today. 
And now there are a couple of thousand of certified therapists worldwide. So if you're interested in this technique, I'm sure you can do a quick search online and you will find an Imago therapist to get started. But importantly, the core focus of Imago therapy, as I understood it, is on transforming conflict between couples into opportunities for healing and growth. And I mean, maybe this sounds like a bit of a no-brainer to you, but what the founders found was that there is a connection, an obvious connection, between frustrations in adult relationships and our early childhood experiences. You know, our early relationships, they teach us about love, what it is, what we need to do in order to receive it from others and feel safe. Of course, we also develop certain attachment patterns with partners and our sense of self-worth based on how we were treated by these important people in our lives. Were we criticized, rejected, abandoned, only praised for good performance, maybe not shown much, if any, physical affection? All of this stuff matters. Why? Because it creates an imprint, a deep imprint, often in your unconscious or your subconscious, and you only rediscover that later in your romantic relationships, especially after the honeymoon period is over. Because of course, when that delightful chemical cocktail wanes, our old wounds resurface and conflict starts or increases. And the thing is, what I found is that that often leads us, so many of us, to think that that person that we've chosen to be with is just not right for us. And the founders, they ask instead, well, what if instead of saying that is the very reason that somebody isn't right for us, what if that is the very reason that you are in fact right for each other? You know, this relationship it is your mirror it, it, that forces you to look at your old stories so that you have a genuine chance to free and liberate yourself from it. You know, I found that really, really compelling, I've got to say. And the founder, Dr. Hendricks, he said, we are born in relationship, we are wounded in relationship, and we can be healed in relationship. So this idea is that instead of teaching people to simply argue better or otherwise find ways to avoid conflict in a relationship entirely, imago or imago therapy gets us to lean into those tense moments and to use them as an opportunity for exploration, growth, healing, and an even deeper, more fulfilling connection. So, That's kind of the frame. And I spent the last five days doing workshops of this method. So partnership work with David, you know, we did our deep dive into childhood dynamics and some inner child healing. We had conversations about minor frustrations, but also what we love in each other as well. Some guided meditations to imagine the future that we wanted to build together which I actually loved that because I realized how easy it is to get into a comfortable routine with your partner, especially when you're living together. And that kind of comfort can turn into into boredom. And we don't think those few steps ahead of like, actually, what what is the vision for us as a couple together, our future? Let's, Let's give each other permission to dream a little bit, you know? And we also had moments where we listened to other couples too and their dialogues, both positive and negative. And I've got to say, what really shocked me was how something so seemingly light as a conflict or even a positive remark, like even something we actually love in our partner, it has such deep roots So for example, I said, we're listening to couples and their dialogues. So we're in this room, a couple would sit, I'll explain the technique in a little bit, but a couple would sit in front of each other, looking into each other's eyes, holding hands, and we would be all around them listening. And this couple ended up sharing a kind of conflict they had with this guy about how he ended up saying he wanted to spend more time on his bike and he wanted to get a new bike. And at first, what is this? 
But then he was prompted to go further and further into his childhood and really understand on a deeper level what his needs were and what he was missing and why he even wanted that thing in the first place. And it led to this whole story, this deep sadness really about being alone and not playing with in his family, especially with his father. And that led him to spend more and more time on his own and also create a defense mechanism that when he was in conflict, he would flee and want to be on his own. So we just saw all the ways that this played out on such a deeper level from something quite honestly so banal at first. And I do want to share a couple more of these stories to really illustrate, but I think first I just want to explain this way of having a conversation, which was a total first for me. I'd never heard about it before and I definitely felt kind of weird and uncomfortable to start off with, but I thought, you know, okay, I'll stay open-minded because I realized, well, I've never, I don't know about you, but I've I've never really been taught how to communicate well in relationships. Like I learned, of course I learned, but from who? Like, you know, take that time to ask your, yourself that too. Who were your teachers in love? Were they also aware of how they were communicating? Did they work on themselves? Did they understand themselves? And often I think we, we learn from people who really don't know how to communicate well themselves and people who do carry their own emotional baggage and their stories that they offload onto their partners. So this technique, now maybe some of you listening, you might be the type who loves a good system and a structure to things. And maybe you would be more enthused at the idea of this technique and in in particular, a three-step formula for a conversation than I was, because at first I was like, oh God, this is really uh, forced, right? But that is the key part. So according to Harvel and Helen, the founders, they said that what they found is that most people talk in monologues or parallel monologues. I talk, you talk, I talk, you talk. And in that approach, if you aren't interrupting your partner, You are certainly getting your response ready to go while your partner is still speaking. And you may well be immediately reacting internally or even externally to what they're saying. And what this means is that true listening does not happen. And instead of staying connected as partners, as a we in conflict, we suddenly become separate. We suddenly see our partner as an adversary and that's why it quickly transforms into a battle he said he said she said they said or you did this or that or but you do that too you know how it goes right and they say well that is obviously a recipe for disconnection for polarization and they wanted to change that so they said let's create this three-step formula that is called the imago dialogue so i'll illustrate So let's say that next time you are upset about something and you want to discuss it with your partner, you would first approach them and ask, is now a good time to have a conversation about topic, about about our sex life, about our finances or about what happened last night? The idea is that you first need to make an appointment and you need to also give, if this is you making the request, you also really need to give your partner permission to say no but they in return need to suggest when would be a good time to talk. And I already got that as a first step and so many people in the room resonated. Like I remember one man, he really felt like his wife was intruding on his peace. Like when he finally sat down at the end of a busy day at work on the sofa, he just wanted to watch something and chill out. His wife would then interrupt him and say, you know, and they would have their d- minor dispute about something. And he said he always felt intruded so immediately he said actually the idea that we need to set a time to have a difficult conversation and genuinely uh, be on the same page about it and open to that talk that that was great so anyway I'll get back to you on this when I see how it goes in uh in reality when David and I practice but let's say for these purposes that they say yes they're free so you would then sit on a chair opposite each other face to face and holding hands 
And because you were the one who suggested the talk, you would be first the speaker and your partner the listener. Or to use their vocabulary, they say sender and receiver. You would then spend a moment looking into each other's eyes, breathing more deeply, making just making a connection with each other and giving each other your full attention, which let's be honest, when we do those conversations where we butt in and we say, we need to talk about this, you know, your partner might be on the phone and kind of half giving you their attention and only when it becomes conflictual, they put their phone down and so give each other your full attention. And then the three steps that they use, they're called mirroring, validation and empathy. So step one, mirroring. First in this conversation, you would explain your frustration And your partner would then need to repeat it back to you. And you would prompt by saying something like, okay, um, have I heard that correctly? Is is that what you said? Did I capture it all? And they said, the founder said, the reason why they did this is because they realized that accuracy is actually a problem. Like people quickly, they think they're listening, but actually they're interpreting and they're not getting it right. They're playing their own stories or they're interpreting what their partner is saying through their own vision of the world with their own past experiences, their own perspectives. So actually to, and another thing they said we also do, which I'm sure I've been guilty of a number of times is, is kind of saying like, are you done yet? You butt in or you, can I talk now? You quick, you quickly want to cut them off. And that All that does is activate a defense mode in your partner. So really the first step in in mirroring back is creating this space for slower conversation, being more intentional about the words that you say, not going on big rants, but really getting to the core of something. And the emphasis is really on healing, like the healing power of listening, of being heard. So that's the first step. And then your partner would have to give you a summary back of what you just said so did I get it all and then okay this is in in essence your frustration and so on step two is validation and this is where the the listener so the receiver would really recognize their partner's point of view and it is done explicitly to build trust and connection and it's based on the recognition that we all have our own interpretations of things but just because we have one way of viewing things, it doesn't mean that our partner is wrong. So it's kind of a way to avoid the ego battle and to cross a little bridge into your partner's world and to understand really why the, where they are coming from. And you would, you would show this by saying, okay, you make sense or, you know, I can understand that me regularly being late feels like I am disrespecting you and I'm not valuing your time as, as much as my own. I, I can understand why you feel like that, that makes sense. And the third step is empathy. And this is really where, I mean, empathy is really suffering in combination with another, right? It's like understanding their feelings, feeling with them. And this may come more naturally for some people than for others, but it's really done to increase connection with each other and and love, really, that's what it is at its essence. So what where I really connected so I gave the lateness example it's actually kind of true it's something that comes up for David and I a lot and I gotta say I really experienced this differently because while I know that I'm regularly late and that frustrates David I can't say I felt empathy for why he would feel like I'm disrespect disrespecting him and where the empathy came in was when through this conversation and the prompts that they give you, we went into why that triggered David so much. You know, we we generally agree, okay, being di- being late is disrespectful to another person's time. But more deeply, what? why does that bother you? Or why did that bother David so much? And he shared with me a beautiful personal story that brought tears to my eyes, something linked in his childhood, a relationship with his father that really made me go, oh, ouch. And I connected to, you know what, but I love you so much. I don't want to hurt you. And I don't want to hurt you in uh, unintentionally, of course, but me being regularly late, it brings up that story for you. It causes you a legitimate stress for a legitimate reason. And 
that was really one of the key transformational experiences, I would say. So so that's the core idea of this Amago dialogue. And we would then participate in in workshops to explore that and put that into practice. And if this is something that you're going, mm, okay, maybe there is something in this in this formula, we could give it a go. Like I said, I'm sure you're going to find heaps of resources online and also have a therapist to guide you if that's what you want. But the first time I saw this in action before we tried it ourselves, it was modeled to us by another couple at the retreat. So they were sitting opposite each other in their chairs in the center of the room with the therapist in between, like to the side, guiding them. And we would all sit around and they had to use this three-step formula to discuss a minor frustration. So the husband was the, the speaker, the sender, and he started talking about how he felt frustrated when he would come home from work and the cupboard doors would be left open, right? And at first, I'm not going to lie, David and I totally shared a sideways judgmental glance like, oh man, this man must be difficult to live with. Like, how are we talking about a door, a door being left open? And for sure, at first, his wife was also on the defensive, like if not verbally, because obviously they're being forced to slow down in their conversation by this formula. You could totally feel all of the nonverbals from her, right? Like you could see the eye roll of it's a bloody cupboard door. Are you kidding me? But what really surprised and moved so many of us was actually the roots of that because he was guided by the therapist to consider what triggered him meaning what story from his past was arising in the present moment when he would come home and see those cupboard doors open. And he shared ultimately with a tear or two about his chaotic childhood where he felt like he could never have any peace and serenity at home. And that's really what he just so desperately wanted to feel and so desperately what he wanted to create in his relationship with his wife and we could all see that this was a more closed and quiet man who was not particularly open, probably with his emotions, but also in a verbal way too. And the fact that he opened up about that, it moved his wife. Like you could s literally see the transformation on her from the dismissive eye roll, kind of wanting to cross your shoulders, or your, your arms, to then actually a tear being brought to her eyes and them looking at each other so deeply and with such tenderness and they share this beautiful moment together it was the first day and I kid you not they ended up like arm in arm for the rest of the four days and totally did all of this work and we could all see the transformation that they had and that was like I said it was on the first day and it made me think okay maybe this whole structured conversation thing with the focus on truly listening, like truly hearing out your partner, speaking slowly, concisely, connecting to your emotions and, and linking to stories in your past. I mean, I thought th this is just all so, so critical. And it leads me to my first takeaway that I want to share with you. And that was all we all really want is to be truly seen, heard, understood and accepted. And I genuinely think this is why we so quickly get on the defensive in arguments or why we rush to justify ourselves or prove our points or and why we also have a whole array of defense mechanisms too, like pushing away, fleeing, disconnecting, being aggressive. And time and again during the retreat, both in demonstrations with the other couples and also in exercises that David and I did together, I so saw the transformative healing power of empathy. It just changed something really. And it was entirely different to share a vulnerability, for example, from my childhood with David from an open hearted, connected space rather than just casually talking about it or staying purely mental and I really know and I've really felt that this is where we find and restore the wholeness that we were born with you know it's not about the fancy house or the status job or any of that it is really about being loved for who we are and being appreciated for for that for what we bring 
And another lesson I took for the retreat, so second one here, good listening skills are crucial to a successful relationship. And you may think you're listening, but you're actually not. (laughs) So like I said, I always thought of myself as a great listener. Like, sure, yeah, I hear out your perspective before sharing my own. Oh, Lord, did this experience challenge that belief I had of myself? Because through that whole mirroring process, so that first step I described to the Imago dialogue, where you would essentially have to repeat back what your partner said every second sentence or so, I realized two things. One, instead of fully listening to David, I was listening to my own voice in my head. Sometimes I was mildly distracted or sometimes I would get swept away in a memory or it it, it, it would just bring a flash of something else that would come into my mind and I would get like drifted. I drifted away with that and then I would miss the next part of his sentence and having to repeat that back to him made me realize to what extent I wasn't fully present and to what extent I didn't capture the full picture, the full essence of what he was trying to communicate to me. And second, I also realized that I could not help but interpret what he was saying based on my own thoughts and perspectives. So rather than genuinely listening to his perspective, for example, on why it frustrates him that I am regularly late, like, yep, we we spoke about this at length, let's say, I would be piecing together other things, other parts of his story and be like, oh, yes, I know that this, this is probably why this bothers you so much or... And probably if I'm honest with myself, those are probably the moments in a typical conversation with him where I would interject, where I'd interrupt him and be like, okay, I know what you're going to say next. So I'll just finish it off for you or uh, let's keep it moving forward. And I've got to say, I saw so much benefit in actually being forced to slow down in conversation and to genuinely listen. And I that genuinely felt like a personal development or even a spiritual growth exercise in itself. Like I felt much more of a connection with that inner voice that we talk about so much on this podcast, like distancing ourselves from that, which is which is essentially our ego and the thing that to have a successful relationship, we need to touch ourselves from a little bit. So undoubtedly the part of accurately mirroring back to him what he said, it made us feel more connected It made David feel more heard, more valued, more respected, and probably also more comfortable in opening up, which is more difficult for him to to share some of the more difficult stories of his childhood. Third lesson, it is not the rupture that is important, but the repair. As I said in the introduction, a key part of Imago therapy is changing the belief that conflict is inherently negative and instead see conflict as a route to growth and healing. Now, obviously, there's some nuance here or a little caveat, I should say. Obviously, there are situations where conflict can be violent and abusive and these things could be open to manipulation. And in those situations, naturally, we do not want to keep repairing or trying to repair something and losing ourselves our integrity in the process I'm not talking about that let's assume that these are two people that uh that have not got any really substantial you know personality disorders or anything like that they're a genuine ability and willingness to work on themselves but what I realized through this retreat is how how we repair and reconnect after tension is undoubtedly what is the most important. It is It is not the argument that is important. And this is where you have the genuine opportunity to strengthen your connection to your partner. You know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but it makes me think of this Japanese tradition of repairing broken pottery with gold. I don't, I don't recall what it's called. I probably couldn't even pronounce the term, let's be honest. But let's say that a bowl broke into several pieces. It would then be joined back together with a type of gold lacquer and it would end up, you would, you would see the gold, right, and the cracks in it. But the idea, the underlying philosophy is that in the process of repairing things that we have broken, we can actually create something much more unique and beautiful and resilient. And it's also that opportunity to accept our flaws 
to accept our imperfections. It's just a part of life. And that's the opportunity we have in our relationships too, to not see each conflict as evidence that there is something wrong or that you and your partner are just not right for each other. It's just not meant to be like many of the movies would have you believe, but instead to turn it more into a story of like, this is an adventure we get to live together, an experience we get to have. And this is a valuable, integral part of life. So it's a rupture that is important, not it is the, the repair that is report important, sorry, not the rupture. The fourth lesson that I learned is the past continuously, and I mean continuously, shows up in the present until we truly heal. But, but, this is where relationships, especially romantic ones with the level of intimacy and vulnerability that they require, they are such gifts. (laughs) Like they can honestly lead you to growth, expansion, and healing that you often wouldn't find on your own. And it reminds me of a previous episode, actually, Doctor with Dr. Margaret, Margaret Rutherford. So it was episode 58, I believe, how to stop self-sabotaging in love and thrive in relationships. And she said one thing in that totally resonated with me. She's like, you know, when I was single, I thought, I'm great. Like, I have never been so well I have far less conflict. It's just, you know, I feel better. Only then the problem is that most of us feel the tug of loneliness or the pull, the desire to couple up and it starts again. And because you likely didn't heal that problem when you were single, because you just weren't triggered, (laughs) that means that you are inevitably going to face it in your relationship. So, you know, a sensitive story from your past it's, it's, it's not going to come up in the present moment. It's not going to trigger an emotional re- reaction for you because you're likely not going to have the level of intimacy to be bothered. And sometimes, you know, even with our friends, we, I realize we often don't see each other enough. We have such sporadic catch-ups that we don't have the kind of relational types of conflicts. But I'll share, I'll share an example to illustrate. So since doing more inner work, I've realized the extent to which I personally have a deeper need for security because I really lacked it in my childhood. I had an absent father. Um, My mother, while I really love her and I know she has a genuine, beautiful, kind heart, she was not very emotionally stable and very practically consistent and competent. We moved around a lot. We didn't have many friends and I often felt alone and unsupported and noticed that especially it actually came up for me big time in a a memory I I thought I had forgotten actually and I somehow accessed that through through this dialogue with with David and I really recalled a time when we had a big argument and we had moved from Australia to England and we didn't really know anyone I was on my own it was just me my mum and my sister and it escalated big time. I was really scared. I didn't know what to do. And I had no one to call. And I realized that my typical reaction was to toughen up, to dissociate, to defend myself. But actually underneath that was the fear. And this conversation really allowed me to connect to that deeper fear underneath and to truly understand why I was the way I was. You know, why? Yeah, what what did that fear of being unprotected really lead to? How did how did that lead me to become the person I did? And and like I said, there was a part of a defense mechanism of I'm a tough one, you know, to protect that insecure little girl inside. It led me to dissociate from my body in times of conflict, to literally to to have a trauma trauma reaction, like fight or flight. But for me a lot of it was was fight, like get get sharp eyes and feel ready to go, you know? And I would alternate between having being aggressive to them being very submissive. I also had a very, you know, I can do it all myself kind of attitude, fierce independence. And crucially, something I've shared on this podcast so much, it led me to 
unconsciously choose a narcissistic partner. And I say unconsciously because I did not know this in myself. I didn't even want to face this. I didn't want to remember those memories or or feel that fear that I had tried so hard to cover with anger. And of course, that 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 led me to this very person who used all the language and did all the things that the little girl in me wanted to hear, wanted to feel, you know, you're safe with me. You can trust me completely. You're my girl forever. I'll always be behind you. I've got your back. And he, at least in the early stages, showed that with demonstrations of tenderness and affection and support. You know, I often remembered an example of how on one occasion in the dating stages, he, I, I was on a night bus coming back home from university in London and my phone ran out of battery and I fell asleep and I missed my stop. And then I fell over on a curb and hurt my ankle and I couldn't move. And I had to end up hitchhiking home because I didn't even know where I was or how to go. I needed somebody to get me. And anyway, whole story. And he bought me a a portable phone charger. And he said, I want you to keep this in your bag and you can phone me anytime if anything like this ever happens again. Why did that stand out? Because it met a need I so desperately wanted, you know? And I have no doubt there are things like this for you as well in the way that you show up, whether you know it or you don't. Why do I share this? Well, I share this because I want you to know that the true change that you are seeking in yourself and the love life that you want to build or sustain it will come to you as you continue bravely doing this inner work, as you continue bravely facing the truth of yourself, facing your past. And honestly, while it can feel so frightening at first and uncomfortable at first, it is liberating and it will give you the freedom to make better choices. You will, you'll also understand yourself so much, so much better. You will be less, uh, also less open to manipulation, to being manipulated by by other people. And you won't stay stuck in these, in these cycles of self-sabotage or stuck in reactivity. It's an important lesson. You know, really, your, your past will keep showing up. Like, it really, really will until you face it and you heal it. And courage is necessary, but you will be so goddamn proud of yourself. For doing it promise and the last lesson a light lesson <laughs> which is also such a massive component of a joyful life and a fulfilling partnership and that is staying connected is a practice and a key part of that is having fun having fun how many of us honestly get stuck in the usual routine of life in our relationships with all of our responsibilities and our to-do list and our lack of time and our lack of energy, it is so, so easy to get pulled into the monotonous. And thanks to also our brain's bias for negativity, it is so easy to stay in complaint and blame. And even when we think we're being positive, actually, in our relationships, it's often tinged with negativity So I loved actually, we shared a couple of examples of this or my mother-in-law did. And she said, you know, for example, let's take the so-called compliment. You look beautiful today. First, it sounds all right, right? I was like, oh, that sounds okay. But it's, it's tinged with negativity. It's not you are beautiful. It's you are beautiful today. And what does our brain do sometimes? Well, it interprets that as, oh, I look nice today and not all the other days or he thinks I'm only beautiful when I get dressed up. And but To counter that negativity and the monotony and to genuinely find happiness and joy, we need to put in the time and effort to have special shared experiences, even when it feels hard, especially when it feels hard, they said. And this is one of the main parts of the retreat. So we were told at the end of one of the days that we had to keep the evening open for a little surprise. We were told that in the morning and we said, okay, surprise comes in the evening. And we had to prepare something for our partner, knowing their likes, their tastes and so on, that would spark joy into the relationship. 
And we shared all about our experiences the next day. And honestly, some of them were so wonderful. And the energy in the room was palpable. Like everyone had, was just so much more joyous. You know, they had so much more vitality. And the idea also in doing this was to break the monotony, but also to push ourselves a bit out of our comfort zone, do things that we wouldn't normally do because having variety in life is also a key component of happiness. So some of the examples that I love, like, you know, one couple, they ended up, I think she, she ended up doing a strip tease. I think she'd never done that before for her partner. She was probably really embarrassed about it, but she was like, okay, I know that's something he's always wanted me to do. And she challenged herself to do it. And then she kind of admitted, you know what? I actually, I actually kind of got into it. I liked it. Um, Or there was another example where one husband, he knew that his wife really loved nature and he was, he was like less into that. But what he did, I thought this was a super creative, beautiful idea. So he said, okay, he bought a bottle of champagne and foie gras, like how French, um, and they had a date in a tree. So he found a tree somewhere in the local neighborhood, like a big, a big tree that he could easily climb. And he set up like a little tree house. So he put pillows and blankets. So made this, you know, makeshift tree house. And they had their picnic up there with their champagne and their snacks. And then I think he also kind of jokingly sang her a French love song. And, you know, I, I think why I also loved that example, because it's like, oh my gosh, sometimes this can be so simple and it doesn't need to be something that costs a lot of money, but just giving, getting a little bit creative sometimes and giving yourself permission to break out of that routine of being serious, which, I mean, we have differing degrees of that. I know Dave and I definitely fall into the too serious kind of category and, you know, our dates end up being the usual go to a nice restaurant and have a nice drink. And I'm sure that's lovely, but I got to say doing something really different and out of the norm was way more fun. And not only that, it was a great de-stressor to be joyous, to be childlike, to be a bit silly. And it, it sparked that joy and made us feel more deeply connected. So, you know, I, you know, takeaway here is think outside the box and do something a little bit more fun and do it for each other as a little bit of a gift. Maybe have a little surprise and just see what that brings you. I think it does bring something special. It doesn't need to be that often, but I reckon, you know, Dave and I said, we're going to give this a go once a month and each of us come up with a different, different activity like that. So summary in the lessons, one, All we really want is to be truly seen, heard, understood, and accepted. Two, good listening skills are crucial to a successful relationship. And you might think you're listening, but you're actually not. So you might want to give that a go and look a bit more closely. Three, it is not the rupture that is important, but the repair. Focus on how you reconnect after tension, not the tension itself. Four, Your past will continuously show up in the present until you truly heal. And five, staying connected is a practice and a key part of that is having fun together. Thank you for listening to this episode. I genuinely wishing you all the best, raising your toast for you, your love life, current, future, genuinely hope that you can find, create and keep the love that you want and you deserve. Now, if you know of anyone who would enjoy or benefit from listening to this episode, please do share a link with them. But in the meantime, have a wonderful week.